The CALB Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and our program tonight is entitled Ink on the Brink, the Future of Print Journalism. Now, the title itself suggests that print journalism does have a future which is encouraging since everyone lately has been writing a so bit. So my first question of the panel, this is the obvious one. If it does have a future, what does that future look like in, say, 10 or 15 years from now? But let me first quickly introduce the panel itself. To my left, Marcus Broccoli, the executive editor of the Washington Post. He was, before coming to the Post, the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. Also for 15 years, a foreign correspondent for the journal in Asia and in Europe. He's won many journalism awards. To my right, David Hunky, the president and publisher of USA Today, the newspaper with the largest circulation in the United States. Before taking this job, he was chief executive officer of the Detroit Media Partnership, and he was also publisher of the Detroit Free Press. He led the team that won the Pulitzer Prize for local reporting. To my immediate left, Cynthia Tucker, a twice a week columnist for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where she was the paper's editorial page editor. She also writes a blog. And in 2007, she won a Pulitzer Prize for her commentary. She is now her paper's, quote, national political columnist based here in Washington, DC. To my right, Anne Bagamary. She is the senior editor of the International Herald Tribune, which is the global edition of the New York Times. She's based in Paris, where she's been, I think, for about 15 years now. And she has major responsibility for business news, which has certainly been in the news. OK, you've all had a chance now to think about that opening question. What will newspapers look like? In 10 to 15 years, will there be newspapers as we know them today? We'll start with Cynthia Tucker. Oh, great, Marvin. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, first, I want to say how delighted I am to be here and to see an audience so interested in this question. It makes me a little frightened, though, to think that they may think that I actually know the answer to the question. <laughs> I don't. And my um, answer may convey my, my hopes, my optimism about the future of print. I certainly think that there will continue to be newspapers in 20 years, but I fear that there won't be nearly as many of them. I think that we are going to look at a couple of decades of consolidation. Um, there, I think that there will be fewer news magazines, fewer newspapers. 20 years from now, I hope that there will still be large uh, national newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the IHT, the International Herald Tribune. I think the future for regional newspapers, like the one that I work for, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, is more uncertain. Hmm. Um, and I think that that would be a loss. Certainly there are many good reasons why we look uh, for big national newspapers that cover the huge events of the day. But I think without regional newspapers, uh, medium-sized city newspapers, um, a lot of citizens would be in the dark about what's going on in their state houses and their city halls. And I think that that's where we'll see some losses. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, Dave Hunky, will there be a USA Today? in 20 years? There'll be a USA Today in 20 years. What's it going to um, look like? Well, I suspect it's going to be very much a hybrid of what you, um, you may see today. And we have to keep in mind, USA Today is its own 
rather unique uh, creation. It's also only 27 years old, and a lot of the institutions that we're talking about in many cases are almost two centuries, two centuries old. But USA Today, like many other newspapers, are going to have to evolve rapidly. And the answer of how this is going to happen, I still contend, is going to be a joint decision between the citizens and engaged citizenry in this country, the folks who run news and journalism organizations, and the businesses, like myself, and frankly, to a large degree, whether we continue to have commercial partners. Those are advertisers. There are a lot of people a part of this equation. And over a period of 20 years, let's also keep in mind, 20 years ago, the people hadn't founded Google yet. They're going to be still rapidly developing forms of transmitting news, information, and entertainment to us. So we have to keep that calculation out there as well. But if we are serious about the primary tenets of journalism and understand how important it is in this country, we will find the business models and the devices that allow us to be here in 20 years. Well, you know, I was going to throw a question at you. We absolutely, you said, believe in the future of great newspapers, but we can no longer do business as usual. And you were suggesting that a moment ago. How is the business itself going to change? I mean, you're the boss at USA Today. What would you be doing differently 10 years from now? Um, I'm still, and I believe very strongly in this, 10 years from now, I better have discovered a business model that works for a lot of people that allows us to continue to hire, retain, and train the intelligence, the fundamentals of journalism. This is what anybody pays us for. This is the entire key to engagement. So my job principally is not on the journalism side, it's on the business side to unlock the funding streams that allow us to continue to produce the content that create this thing, whether it is ink on paper or any other device. And Bagamari, the International Herald Tribune. Now, it's been there for a long, long time. Can we count on it being there for another 10 or 15 years? And I ask the question specifically with the backup question that I'm told that you guys have been losing about 40 million bucks a year. Now you can't continue. Is that right? No, that isn't right. Okay. I can say that. Then I, I back off that. That's what I was told. Uh, what have you been losing each year? <laughs> not 40 million. What, what has it been? It's not 40 million. That much I can tell you. Okay. Um, it's, you may have been thinking of other newspapers when, you, when somebody told you that. Mm -hmm. No. Um, Will the Herald Tribune be there in another 15 years? We've been here for 122 years. In fact, yesterday I was reminded this evening at dinner was the 122nd anniversary of the paper. We've been through a succession of owners. Uh, most recently, our principal owner of the New York Times has been in charge since 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, each change of ownership has brought a different cast, if you like, to the way our business is conducted, but the fundamentals of what we do have not changed. And you know, uh, everybody's going to be talking tonight, I think, about the importance of quality journalism, the importance of maintaining standards, of training the next generation. That is what we've been about for 122 years. So that principal mission isn't going to change. The business side of it is, quite frankly, somebody else's job. Those of us on the editorial side are responsible for making sure that the product that we produce is worth paying for. And so if, if, if you want to look about 15, if you want to look out 20, 30 years, I have absolute confidence that there will be an IHT. Okay. And are you at this point a money-making newspaper? The way, since we are a wholly owned subsidiary of the New York Times, it's not broken out in terms of profit. It's broken up in, ter up in terms of what we call contribution margin. So. Costs are shared across the whole organization, and revenue is attributed to certain parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. On that basis, we contribute. Okay. <laughs> let, it, let it go with that for the, time, for the time being. Let it go with that. Marcus Broccoli, The Washington Post, my lifeline of the world every morning. Thank you. Um, what is your crystal ball about the Post longevity? My crystal ball about the Post longevity says the Post will be here for a long time to come. I don't see any reason that the Post, even as a newspaper, won't continue to publish. And certainly as a news organization, we intend to be here. We serve our readers over every platform that comes along and adapt pretty much as quickly as we can and as quickly as our readers do. Um, I think that what we produce is journalism, high quality information and news. Um, 
ideas and commentary for which we believe there is a robust market. And the market tells us there's a robust market. We have more readers and users, as they call them, online today than we've ever had in our history. Online, but not the newspaper. Right, but I think the, the newspaper circulation has actually been quite stable over the last year or so, um, which may have something to do with just a great flow of news. Um, I think that there is a very strong, loyal core of readers for a newspaper like the Washington mm -hmm. Post. And even though newspaper circulations in some cities have been ebbing, um, there, is, there remains dedicated readership for newspapers in this country. Most newspapers in this country today do make money. They don't all make the money they used to make. And one of the things that's caused all the consternation at the moment is that newspapers that once made very large margins are making thinner margins. And many of them are parts of large companies that took on great deals of debt during corporate transactions to build up giant newspaper or news conglomerates. They can't make their debt payments with the narrower margins, hence the crisis. But newspapers themselves are not in many cases unprofitable. In fact, smaller newspapers around the country are doing, in many cases, quite well. There are papers that really own their market. There's, if you go to Manhattan, Kansas, um, I think it's the Mercury in Manhattan, Kansas, that newspaper has a paid online model. So if you want to see that newspaper online, if you live in that community, you have to subscribe to it. The reason they do that is because they're trying to not to make money necessarily on the online side, but to encourage people to continue to read the print edition. I know, but I could point and out any number of cities where newspapers have gone under there in will the be, last year or so. There's also. no question that there are newspapers under pressure, and there are some newspapers, there are a number of newspapers operating either as newspapers or as part of larger groups under bankruptcy protection. And not all, not all of those newspapers will emerge, and some, com some cities will, I think, lose their newspapers in coming years. But I think newspapers still have a fairly strong audience in most cases, and in places like Washington, a very robust and oh, yeah. strong audience. Well, let me ask you about your paper based on something that was in Vanity Fair in an article recently, which I'm sure you have read. In the article, it said that you have about a two to five year period now to come up with what is called an alternative to the post as we know it today. So number one, uh, do you buy into that kind of projection? No, I think that's simplistic. First of all, you know, or what? It, two to five years and the Washington Post doesn't exist? To come up with that's, an alternative to the paper that we know today. Well, I don't think, first of all, I don't think there'll be an alternative. I think this is, you know, people are looking around for a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. Um, there are myriad new opportunities for news organizations to explore. There are many possible avenues for generating revenue. You know, we now distribute our newspaper over Kindle, which is no longer a new thing, but there are new tablet computers coming out, new e-readers coming out. You'll be able to find the Washington Post and other newspapers like USA Today, the Atlanta paper on these platforms. Um, we will serve our readers on mobile phones, on mobile Do you devices. Make any, excuse me for interrupting, but you're mm -hmm. making a big deal about this. Do you guys make any money by placing all of your copy on Kindle and all of the other sure. digital devices. I mean, we, we have a profitable business right now in distributing Washington Post news over mobile phones. And I don't know how large any of these markets is individually at the moment, but it's clear if you look at the trajectory, some of these are growing very rapidly. But I do know that collectively, they give us hope that we can generate <laughs> substantial revenues from other sources than newspapers. And mind you, the newspaper is still a huge revenue generator and for a lot of Americans, newspapers are still a primary source of information that isn't going away anytime soon. Yeah, but I, I mean, we could go on with this, but I'm told that the Kaplan educational arm of the big Washington Post is where you're really making the money and not at the newspaper. Sure. I mean, the Washington Post company, which began as the Washington Post newspaper in 1877, I think that's our <laughs> legacy, um, is a holding company. And it owns more than the Washington Post newspaper. It owns television stations, it right. owns a cable TV network, and it owns Kaplan Education, which was a, a very smart <laughs> investment for which we are deeply grateful in news business at the moment, <laughs> because it's producing substantial revenues for the Washington Post company that make our owners, Don Graham is the chairman, the son of Kay Graham, really determined and able to be determined to find the right model for the news business. Well, and the Washington Post is very fortunate because it does have a family behind it, not a large corporation, and a very wealthy 
family behind it, so it's good to have a couple of bucks. But I don't have to tell any of you that there is declining circulation, and ads have fallen off the table, and... Excuse me. Yes. The IHT circulation is growing. Good, good, good. I'm delighted. I just we'll get to I, that, I too. I think it's also... Well, no, that that's point. good. That's good. And Martin, it's important that. to say, I think I said this before, but circulation is one measure of readership and engagement. We have, we're reaching readers in other ways. Now, yeah, if you want to just look at newspapers narrowly, you know, our circulation is not what it was five years ago. On the other hand, our circulation in the last year has been pretty flat, which in the current climate isn't bad. It's good. Right. But, I mean, the Post, for example, has had four buyouts, to the best of my knowledge, within the last three, four, five years. And that means that you've gone from a force of about 900 reporters down to a force of 500. More than that, but yeah. Well, you have more than five. Yeah. Okay. Substantially more than, than five, but we've, we've clearly gone down. And other newspapers have, have also reduced their staff. Right. Now, the question that I'm getting at is there's a wonderful poll that's done by the George Washington University Battleground Poll, which is a good poll. And it says that 61% of the American people believe they'll be able to get the information they need to be informed citizens in a vibrant democracy even if the newspaper in their city goes under, goes out of business. Now, you were talking before, Cynthia, about the possibility, looking ahead, that regional papers may go under. What happens in a community like Atlanta if the Journal-Constitution goes under? I simply can't imagine. I read a story um, several months ago that predicted that um, San Francisco could easily become the first major city to be without a daily newspaper. It is hard for me to fathom what a city like San Francisco would be without a daily newspaper. Uh, Detroit now doesn't have newspapers publishing daily. They're publishing a few days a week, but Detroit no longer has newspapers published every day. Is that right, Dave? No, I'm going to have to edit you. <laughs> no, go ahead. I have oversight of Detroit and was the publisher. We publish a quarter of a million papers Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all for sale, one dollar, and Saturday. But what you're referring to, and this was the very valid point, we had to make a decision in Detroit or we weren't going to survive. We had another little problem called the auto industry and unemployment that is unimaginable. We had to make a decision that we were not going to continue to drive newspapers to your homes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, but we would have essentially a weekend home delivery package. We would drop the gasoline, diesel fuel, manufacturing, printing, and paper costs in exchange for maintaining the journalism. And I will tell you, it's far too early to call a victory, but we're hitting our circulation goals, and Detroit will be cash flow positive by the end of this year. Wait a sec. Now, Cynthia was talking about certain days of the week when you don't so have a paper. So it is published, Thursday oh, yeah. and papers Friday. are published every day, but two they're not. Two newspapers, two competing newspapers But they are day. not We delivered. don't offer home delivery. We don't drive it to your home. But we have electronic editions, digital editions, replica editions as well that come. Supposing you don't have a computer, how are you going to get your edition? Yeah, at, at 27,000 locations, there are great competing two different newspapers that are for sale every day. Let me jump overseas for a minute to uh, Paris. We'll go to the International Trib. Um, to the best of my knowledge, when the New York Times bought the International Trib, and correct me on this if I'm wrong again, they paid $65 million, right? I believe it was 75. 75 billion bucks. Uh, well, I'm within 10 anyway, uh -huh. so that's not bad. Um, but I want to go back to that figure that you dismissed before, and you didn't really give me an answer to my question. You are, or are you not, a money-making newspaper today? Marcus was making the point that most newspapers may still be making money, but not as much as they did before. Mm -hmm. So are you making less money or no money? I'm going to have to be very careful how I answer this question, because since we are a subsidiary of a company, these figures aren't broken out. What do you mean by broken out? I mean that there is not a separate balance sheet that's released to the public that about the International Herald Tribune. They said that it is not made public. That is not made public. And okay. is not even made widely public within the organization. Within the <laughs> However, what we are told is that we are contributing to 
the profitability of the New York Times Media Group, which is the corporate okay. designation, the corporate subsidiary of which we are a part. No. And one of the reasons that we are contributing is because many of the cutbacks that you were discussing with Marcus and that everybody knows is happening widely in the United States happened a few years ago in Europe. One of the blessings and curses, if you like, of living outside of a big and vibrant economy like the United States is that the highs are not quite as high when things are good, but the lows are not quite as low. Mm. And as a result, your planning tends to be, I'm not on the financial planning side, but I am a business reporter, so I look at this as an observer. Um, your planning is a little bit easier in that sense. And you also don't have quite as much of a crisis situation developing when there's an economic downturn. So you have the opportunity okay. to, to make some of the tough decisions and you don't have to make them in the heat of, of a big downturn and reporting to shareholders that you're not going to make your numbers that way. Okay. The New York Times itself is in trouble. The New York Times earlier this year or last year had to go down and talk to Mr. Slim in Mexico City to pick up an awful lot of millions in order to make its payments. Um, the New York Times has lost money in any number of different ways. I don't want to depress you, but <laughs> if the, the financial people at the New York Times decide that they really don't have the money any longer and they have to peel off assets here and there, the idea of the international trip being dropped is not far-fetched, right? I suppose in the sense that anything is possible, that there's intelligent life on Mars, it's, not, it's a question I can't really answer okay. because uh, I'm not Janet Robinson and I'm not Arthur Salzberger, Jr. I will no. tell you this, Janet Robinson, president of the New York Times Company, was just in Paris talking to us and she was extraordinarily complimentary of everything we've done, including all of the, all the cutbacks and she uh, stood four square behind keeping the International Herald Tribune and using it to extend New York Times journalism around the world. So. You know, and I can only go by what is available to the general public within my building, and okay. I have to take her at her word that that was an expression of support. Right. Now, um, the people who would buy the International Trib generally are those people who speak English, live in Europe or other parts of the world now, and depend upon the Trib for their news. Not entirely. But Our readership is actually pretty evenly divided in three groups. One is what you think of as the average trib reader, an American expatriate, living in a country not his or her well, own. English speaking. And that, and, English, yeah. and that person does tend to depend on the trib, not only for news, but as a lifeline to America. Sure. I mean, we all, if there's anybody here who traveled in Europe as a student, we remember going mm -hmm. and, and looking on Tuesday, and because it was Tuesday before we could get the football results. Okay, well, good news, we get them now in the Monday paper, uh, and you can get them online Saturday afternoon. But I guess the point is that that's only one third of our readership now. There's also a third of our readership that is uh, people living in their home countries. So a British family in Britain, a French family in France. And there's another third that we call third country nationals. So it would be a diplomatic family from sure. India living in Paris. Okay. All of these people do speak and read good English. Most of them do not have English as a first language. Yeah. So they are not totally dependent on the trip. Okay. for their news. Okay. They use it as a trusted source. Okay. Interestingly enough, some of our greatest circulation growth in, uh, in Europe has been in Britain, where you would think that there'd where be plenty of competition in our native tongue, right. but they buy the trip. Cynthia, let me turn to you for a sec. Um, you've just started to write a blog, right? Yes, I have. And that is in addition to your twice a week column. Yes. You are therefore already paying your respects to the world of the blog, of the digital <laughs> age, as you put yes. it a moment ago. But the blogs are filled with opinion journalism, filled with it. And I'm wondering, really out of total curiosity, how has that fact affected your work as an opinion columnist for a newspaper? How does it work? Well, I see um, my blog as an extension of the work I do as a columnist. Um, I was talking to a student earlier about what personality I think my blog should have and how it should be different from the work that I do in print. I have spent decades 
in the print journalism business. I've been writing a print column for a very long time. I think I know what that should be like. I know what the standards are. Sure. Um, I know what um, the professionalism I bring to it. I know that I should interview people. I know that it should be accurate. Um, it's not entirely clear to me what I should be bringing to the opinion pieces I put online. I certainly think it should be accurate, but I'm not sure what the personality of it should be. But you use that word personality. I'm told that you have to be very personal. You as an individual have to come through in a blog or people aren't going to read it. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we has, it, see. has the presence of the blogs and opinion journalism affected you in any way as a columnist? Um, I think that uh, there is huge potential in the ability to communicate with readers almost immediately. That's the exciting part. That's the part that most of us old-fashioned print journalists like. Um, readers are free to comment on the opinions I write on my blog. They do immediately. Um, and I, it is interesting to see what readers have on their minds. Um, sometimes I get additional information uh, that gives me other ideas about subjects I should pursue, columns that I should write in print. That's the upside. Mm. Um, the downside, I think, is um, in trying to figure out how this contributes to real journalism and trying to make sure that it continues to be real journalism that conforms to the professional standards to which I think we all wish to adhere. Let me just take a minute now to uh, tell our listening and viewing audience that this is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and we're talking today about the future of print journalism with Marcus Brockley of the Washington Post, Cynthia Tucker of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and Bagmarie of the International Herald Tribune, and David Hunky of USA Today. Let's pick up our conversation with one statistic. According to editor and publisher over the past year or so, job losses in journalism have risen from about 1,000 a month in January of 2008 to more than 7,000 a month by December of 2008. And Dave Hunky, do you see a time in the relatively near future when you at USA Today will be able to hire more journalists rather than go through the painful process of letting them go? Um, we actually have positions posted right now, but that's not going to be an answer yes to your question. Um, there's very little visibility into 2010 on core newspaper economics. We're going to have to get into the year. We're going to have to watch the national economy. It's, it's almost a question of when does this country stop laying people off? When do we begin to get the sense from, because many of us are consumer driven, that we've, we've clearly hit a bottom in this country and we're beginning to slowly stabilize and build. And I think when we get to off, that. They weren't yes. you letting people off uh -huh. before the economy went south? My understanding is that newspapers, I mean, you guys are all relatively optimistic here, but my understanding is that people are losing jobs in newspapers all over the country. Yeah, you'd have to ask a specific, about a specific newspaper in some cases. If I went back, and I'm answering here for Marcus on this, but if you go back historically to Washington Post, they were shifting those jobs as they migrated into digital formation. Um, but it's, it's certainly been a rough decade for print journalism with the explosion of, of, of digital platforms. Yeah. But the question is, do we think we're done with this? Um, I, I, I think it would be pre premature for me to tell you we're done, but I certainly think we're at a point we can begin to sense some stability going forward That's on good. this. Harvard, good. On this yes, subject, Marcus, please. You know, first of all, I, I, I question the statistic you gave. 7,000 a month is 84,000 a year, and I'm not sure I mean, it may be true for some period. In both cases, by the way, in, in that questioning of the 7,000 yeah. and in your questioning of the 40 million, I will send you the, the place where I got the information. Thank you. I don't trust everything that's in print. If it's, not, <laughs> if it's not in the Washington Post. I'm never sure. But, Especially numbers. Numbers. Um, 
But let's say, let's say 84,000 a year is the pace of job losses, which I think would wipe out the journalism profession pretty fast. I think what's, what is really happening, and to your point about this happening before the most recent economic downturn is, there is a secular shift afoot. You know, newspapers had, you know, in industry parlance, had overcapacity. They had, to, they had the ability to produce more journalism than they needed to produce. I mean, if you went to the White House, I mean, back when you were a correspondent covering Washington, how many reporters, you know, covered the White House? You, a lot of people would cover the same event that today you can get not only from a wire service, but you, your audience can actually view online live, or you can see on cable television. There's so many other sources of this information. And if all you're going to do is repeat the same information in the same way and not add any value for your audience, you probably don't need the journalists doing that particular kind of information. So you take your resources and you dedicate them to journalism where you really make a difference, to original journalism, high impact journalism. You define what it is that you have to do. And for a lot of metro papers and local papers, it's do your community right. And indeed, one of my biggest concerns in the decline of journalism jobs and the, and the troubles, the financial troubles newspapers are having is that in metro areas where there, are, there is a risk that there won't be newspapers in some cases, that there won't be strong coverage of local communities because I think that's the big vulnerability. It's not that there isn't going to be strong coverage in Washington. That there is, you, know, you can ask the question whether there's enough people covering different agencies, but in general, there's still a small army of journalists covering Washington for various organizations, and there are new organizations like Bloomberg that have come along and have big staffs. But it's in the communities where metropolitan area newspapers that may be owned by a chain that has a lot of debt that may decide to cut the cost or they, they can't afford to keep operating. And it'll take some time for, after this conflagration rips through, for the green shoots, to borrow a phrase from another debate, to emerge, from, for new forms of journalism to emerge, though I think they will and we're seeing it. If you look in, in communities where, take New Jersey for example, actually where the New York Times is active, there, there's been a lot of really interesting activity. Johnny Roberts in Newsweek has just written an article about it recently. A lot of really interesting activity where small startup news, news blogs are emerging that are covering communities with a level of granularity and detail that you once would have had from a newspaper but today you're getting from journalists conducting journalism in a sort of blog-like, real-time way. What I'm asking is anyone who reads the, the Washington Post on a daily basis, and I have for many years, can see that the paper has gotten thinner. There are fewer reporters out there to get the news. There are holes in your coverage. Now, you can say that that's all being done on the internet. But that is to suggest something that Dave was getting at a moment ago, implying that the people who are being let go from newspapers are getting jobs on the internet. No. That is true to some degree, but not to a very large degree. I keep on getting these emails from people who can't get jobs. So I want to hear from you as you look forward, what becomes your business model. What is, what, what is it that you're trying to do in the next five or ten years to make it clear to people who live in this city that there will be a Washington Post? Well, first, you know, the, to your point on the number of journalists and the amount of space, it is true that there are fewer news columns in the Washington Post today than there were several years ago, although we've taken it back to the level of the early 1990s, preceding the last big economic run-up. And the same is true of staff. We've taken it back somewhat, but we have not reduced our staff. I mean, our staff is still significantly larger than it was, for example, at the time of Watergate. It's double the size of well, the I staff mean, the at that time. Well, the country's larger, too. Right. So you have more potential And the number readers. of stories that we can cover. Well, yeah, no, we I, don't have more potential readers, on, except not for our print edition in any case. Yeah. Um, but I, what but I our wanted... business model is, you know, the business model for news is evolving. There, there is clearly a strong business case to put, produce newspapers in places like Washington. I mean, you know, Dave can address this nationally as well. There are plenty of newspapers and there are plenty of markets where you can publish a newspaper profitably and newspapers are being published profitably. There are other platforms that we need to reach our readers through and that we are reaching our readers through where we also either can be or believe we can be profitable. There will be new technologies emerging. You used a 20-year time frame before. There will be new technologies emerging, a la Google or a la Twitter, or other means of reaching audiences that we don't now have and we now probably can't even envision 
that will change the conversation again. I think large news organizations like ours are, do face some challenges, but I don't think we're going away. We still do provide a very valuable service and have a fairly large, dedicated readership. I don't think there's any doubt, any doubt at all, Dave Funky, I don't think there's any doubt that there's more information around. No one doubts that. You get to a computer, you've got tons of information. Elie Wiesel once said, sitting right here, that there are three levels that you've got information of which we've got tons right now. But then if you go up to another level, you've got knowledge, which is a kind of digested form of the information, an edited form of the information. And then at the highest level, you've got wisdom, which is actually taking the nectar of it all and making it meaningful to people and enriching a democracy. And what I'm trying to get at here is how, as you go from one platform to another and as you dig more deeply into the internet and, and reach for its full potential, how does that make us a better, a richer democracy? How are people getting informed? If you just throw information at them, that doesn't inform them. Well, that is one reason I, I think you will hear some of us continue to describe a hybrid solution to this and why and quite frankly, we're, we're, in, we're in more than a fair amount of trouble as an industry, print newspapers. And that maybe hasn't come across, at least from me today. We are. But there's a number, it, but we will have newspapers, but we have got to diversify the streams of revenue that come in that allow us to hire and retain the journalists that we're talking about to package and deliver this information. The fundamentals of aggressive reporting in a community We've got to pay for that. We had a business model that we lost billions of dollars to Craigslist, and we didn't replace it. And, and, and even though it may seem a little unsanitized or unsavory to suggest, it was our want ads that were putting many of us on stages and podiums to take credit for a lot of this great coverage. We didn't react fast enough to that. So really, and it is perhaps uniquely my perspective on this, again, I run, run our business. Perhaps the real sin in this and the motivation to move quickly is we've got to find a way to rebuild the businesses because we understand the central obligations to our communities, to our nation, and our reporting. We want to maintain those, but we've got to find a way financially to do that and move it across these other platforms David, in a you... way that lets the reader control the access to the information. When you talk about a fourth distribution model, what are you talking about there? Well, or, or more of a hydro di distribution model. I, I will tell you, and Mark has touched on this, believe me, a lot of our costs continue to be tied up in the subject that we mentioned today, which was print. But there are fabulous, enticing devices that will allow us to take everything we do in terms of writing and editing and reading and packaging that people will pay us for with integrated advertising that will move on to all kinds of devices and you will choose whether you want to pick that up as a newspaper, but comprehensive newspapers with embedded video in this that I think will open up all kinds of advertising for, uh, uh, excuse me, revenues and opportunities for us to stay aggressively in the journalism. Now business. that assumes that your content is going to be paid for yes. by the person who has the digital device in the palm of her hands. Now, are you going, how does, does that happen now? The, the, I mean, you're, you're boasting about all this digital stuff. Yes. Does that actually <laughs> make something. money for you? Yeah, we make money on Kindle now. We make money on licensing our content now. I'm sitting up here with folks who are masters at it. And we haven't put enough emphasis on the value of our content and the pricing of it. We're going to have to rely more what, on that. What do you that. mean by that? Well, I think in, we've just given it away. And, and only recently, too many of us in this industry decided, um, heavens, why in the world would we do that? Common sense would tell you there's great value to this content. That's why people are in this room tonight. So you're we selling, have to sell it. Right. You're, but you are already doing that, Yes. Right? And we will, who we else will do more. In the big world of journalism, who else is doing that now? Yeah. The Atlanta Constitution doing that? Um, we have experimented with selling some of our content online, but like most large newspapers, you can still get most of that 
that is published in the daily newspaper free yeah. uh, online every day. Uh, but at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, like at most newspapers around the country, there are people who are sitting in small rooms or large rooms every day struggling with what I think of as the holy grail of journalism at the moment, which is to come up with this integrated business model that supports the journalism that the, we all want to do. And I'm glad Dave, as the publisher on the uh, podium, mentioned the advertising that pays for this work. Uh, while newspapers have been losing circulation for decades, that has been mostly a rather slow process. Um, so slowly we've been losing um, readers, readership. But what is killing us, as I understand it, and I'm not a publisher, I only know what I read in business sections of newspapers, um, is the loss of advertising, particularly those uh, classifieds that paid the bills, sure. um, cars, real estate, and jobs, um, much of which is sold now online. The last time I bought a car, I did not look in the printed pages of a newspaper. You did it on the internet. I did it on the internet. Which an awful lot of people um, are doing. And tell me, um, shifting the focus just a little bit, to the degree that all of this is valid and touches the lives of journalists. Mm -hmm. um, you've been at this for a while now. When you walk into a newsroom today, International Tribune, your case, other newspapers here represented, are you going into a happy environment? <laughs> Marvin, you're talking about journalists. <laughs> we got into this business to, to kick over rocks and see what crawls out from under them. I mean, we got into them to be professional questioners and professional skeptics. It's how we do our job, and we do it well. Is it a happy environment? There are pockets of happiness. I think I, think I have to say, no, I have to say that the people who work, the people who work at the Herald Tribune, the people who work at the New York Times, my friends at the Journal and the Post and, and at Bloomberg, they take great pleasure and great pride in what they do. Isn't that and amazing? every single day, every single day, there's something that makes you say, thank God I chose this business. You know, just the other day, I had a, a very nice conversation with a, I guess you'd call him a senior editor at the New York Times. And I asked him, I said, in preparation for this program that I'm going to do, what's going on at the Times? What should I be? mindful of. He had a very long, sour face. And I said, is it that bad? He said, it's worse. <laughs> um, okay. He said, it's really worse. And I was just kind of curious as to whether this is just a New York Times affliction or whether you might see it at USA Today. You know, of or course the there's a lot of anxiety out there. But, and there, there ought to be a lot of anxiety because we've been going through great tumultuous times. But you know, what does ground most of us in journalism is good journalism. And, Actually, I think you know, this whole conversation has turned so much on the business model um, that we forget that really what drives us and what drives our success most is doing good journalism. And if you see on any website what draws the most traffic, you know, when we have a really blockbuster story on our website, you see huge attention to the journalism. And we know that if we practice good journalism, we will draw eyeballs, we will draw readers, and okay. we ultimately can build a business around that. Let me bring your attention to a recent study by the Knight Foundation, which raised a couple of interesting points. And I'd like to get, appreciate your thinking about it. The report said that one third of the American people have no broadband connection to the internet. And, um, and Alberto Ibarguan, the president of the Knight Foundation, whom I'm sure you all know, he said, quote, that's a hell of a lot of people who don't have access to the way that we're communicating. According to the report we have in this country, a broadband gap, a literacy gap, a participation gap. And I'm wondering, Dave, in, in what way does, does that kind of fact factor into the way in which you run your newspaper and all of the attendant operations? Well, I don't want to come off as the glass half full person on this and, 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 or be dismissive of constituents who, who can't access us. I, I just moved to Washington from Detroit, a city where 47% of the adults are functionally illiterate. You talk about newspapers and how we're going to serve via broadband or distribution to other parts of this world, 
they now look at us with incredible sympathy because of our illiteracy rates and our failure to pay attention to this. So I, I'm not sure how to grapple with an issue that is long, we have 70% of the population with some form of broadband penetration um, based on how poorly we've done in other areas. I almost think that that's somewhat, somewhat commendable. And I don't Absolutely. mean to suggest we don't go further, but you know, good gracious, that's a gigantic question in this room of how do we connect and stay engaged in a society where we have so many people disenfranchised and unable to sure. read us and communicate with us. Sure, uh, Cynthia, you remember that, I don't remember the exact day, but I think it was back in the 60s, there was a report that spoke about two Americas really, a black and a white America. And I'm wondering, is, is there any validity here in what it is that these statistics are saying? That there may be two Americas emerging in the digital age, one that actually is connected, and one that, that as Dave was now saying, isn't even part of that world. And how do you, it, it, does that become, getting to my large question about the impact on our democracy, does that become um, a factor in the way in which we will end up governing ourselves? Are we gonna hurt ourselves by not systematically going into that third of America and making sure that they have access to the internet. Well, actually, Marvin, I think there is some remarkably good news there. Oh, <laughs> One of the things that I am most encouraged about is that while I think that there is certainly a divide, I don't think it's a racial divide. It's a generational divide. Uh, there are certainly, far, if, if you're poor, you're much less likely to have broadband or computer in your home. Mm. But in certainly in large urban school systems, the school systems have been very good about installing computer technology and teaching public school children, no matter what homes they come from, um, to get online, to email, to use computers very well. Their parents may not know how to do it, but they do. And of course, they can do, go to public libraries and use those facilities. I worry much more about rural areas. My mother actually doesn't have broadband, can't get it. She has DSL, kind of slow, but it's OK. But my mother is never going to read a, a newspaper online. I don't care what happens. It's just not she uses the computer, she emails, but she's not going to read the newspaper online. And the two newspapers that serve the very small town that she lives in both circulate from 100 miles away. So one, for reasons that Dave just talked about, one has stopped circulating in Monroeville. Why would you drive trucks that 100 miles um, to circulate a paper to you know, a handful of people who want it on their doorsteps? So she's now getting the paper out of Mobile, but I fear that they will make the same decision in the next two or three years that they can't drive trucks that far. So then I don't know how my mother will get her newspaper. She will no longer have access to a daily newspaper. And in France, um, the president of the country, alarmed by what's been going on with newspapers, um, has he actually taken money out of the French budget and given it to French newspapers like in the... In January of this year, uh, President Sarkozy did earmark 280 million euros, which is about $340 million at today's exchange rate, for support for newspapers. It's sort of a bailout to newspapers in trouble in France. It's a prop up. Let's just say it's, it's a prop, prop up. up. It's, it's, it's tax credits for distribution systems. It was even a fairly uh, interesting, in terms of our discussion tonight, an interesting program. He has proposed offering every 18-year-old yes. in the country a free subscription to the print product of his or her choice. Um, yes, he has done that. Now, that the question that I would like to put to all of you is, does it make any sense at all in the American context of journalism uh, to have a government bailout of newspapers? Dave? Shall I go first? No. Um, no, I would rather see the Justice Department review um, antitrust and, and competitive, competitive business restrictions, I believe, that are upon us. But no, not a government bailout of our journalism. Because? I fear control. 
Marcus? Yeah, you know, my gut says no. Um, I, I guess, given my role in running coverage, I'd rather step back from the, the actual discussion on that one. Hmm. <laughs> do, do you see it as something that is even on the horizon? There are people in Congress who've talked about what it is the government could do to support newspapers, including things like Dave suggested to you know, change the rules governing how certain parts of our businesses are regulated. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's certainly a live conversation in Washington. And I think, you know, looking at it as an observer, I think newspapers in general have a lot of anxiety about becoming dependent in any way on the government. Because of the concern that Dave is raising about control, ultimately. I think those were my words and not Mark's. Um, yes, and mine, I worry about controls. Right. Cynthia, what do you think? Um, well, uh, Marcus's answer told me something when he said he wanted to step back from this because I didn't realize that there was really that much conversation in Congress about it, so Marcus must think that. Uh, <laughs> there will be more discussion of this in Congress, which I think would be fascinating. Um, I, I would love to see what was proposed and see how it worked. After all, when um, the federal government took over GM, one of the first things that happened was that the uh, CEO was bounced. So the last thing you'd want was um, govern a government bailout that resulted in that sort of direct intervention. If I could just add something about the French experience, there, there's a wonderful principle in the United States called separation of powers, which I think a government bailout of the newspapers would go dangerously close to crossing a line that should never be crossed. The same principle doesn't operate in France. Um, there is a, there's the concept of strategic industries. There's also a much tighter relationship between government and certain business interests. And I think that the proposal of the Sarkozy government fell within that context. So I'm not sure that you could ever look at something that happened in France and wonder if it could happen in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's, it's a chalk and cheese situation. I wonder if, if you, as you look back in the history of this country, whether we have gone through similar problem zones as we are right now. Marcus, are you aware? In the newspaper industry? Yeah. Well, you know, newspapers in this country were always a volatile business. I mean, there was a time 100 years ago where there were almost in any size city multiple newspapers. And newspapers often lost a lot of money when run by proprietors who owned them in order to have a voice in their community. And when the proprietor went, the newspaper collapsed. And this was fairly commonplace until really the second half of the last century. It really, you know, newspapers as we know them today as huge profitable quasi-monopolies have existed largely in the last 50 years. Before that, there was intense competition. There were always losers, sometimes big losers. Um, and I think the days of the quasi-monopoly news organization in the, na on the, in the nation and in cities are fading. I think that there is going to be a, a whole you know, new crop of competition coming from sources that we can see and some, some, some sources we probably can't imagine. We've got uh, only a little over a minute here, but I'm just wondering, and when you look into the future, and there are many young people here who would like to go into journalism, is this a career field that you would recommend enthusiastically? <laughs> yes, I would. And one of the reasons you asked before about is the newsroom a happy place to be. I think one of the great pockets of happiness is working with the young people in our newsroom. We have interns and clerks who want to break into this business. They want to see their names in print. They want to do a good job. It's heavy lifting, believe me, to take someone who just has nothing but energy and maybe just the glimmerings of talent and turn that person into someone who can write well for publication. But I think there's nothing more rewarding. And I think every newspaper, even at the NFL, which is what you're looking at here, and, and also especially in the small papers that produced most of us, I would say. My first newspaper was the Norfolk Ledger Star, which doesn't exist anymore, I'm afraid. But those are all the great proving grounds for journalists. It's where you really learn your craft. And I think if anything is going to save this business, it's going to be young people who learn their craft and learn the basics and learn to be good journalists on whatever platform we decide to send it out on. It's the standards that are going to really save this industry and save what we think of as print. So would I recommend it? 
Yes, I would, if you're ready to work, if you're always curious about the world, and if that work and that curiosity is your reward. I say yes, absolutely. Uh, give me 15 seconds. Same question. Absolutely. Um, I am still in this business because I still uh, am thrilled to get up every morning and find out what's going on in the world and tell people what I think about it. <laughs> well, um, I wish the heck that we could go on. I would like to, I would like really to do that, but we have run out of time. We've got the tyranny of the clock once again. But I want to thank our panelists for being so kind uh, to be with us and to speak to us as honestly as they have. Uh, and I want to thank all of you, dear audience, for coming on board and for being with us here tonight. And I would like to say to all of the people watching and listening, remember, a free press is the underpinning of a free society. I'm Marvin Kalb, and remember, as Ed Murrow used to say, good night and good luck.